Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn um, and I run the services um, at uh, medcomsnetworking.com and the associated websites. So information, services, resources, activities for people who work in and around the global medcoms community, by which I'm talking people who work uh, in and around medical communications, medical education, medical publishing and so on, uh, associated businesses, and importantly, anybody who's interested in learning more about medcoms, uh, maybe you're looking for a career opportunity, um, in which case, specifically, I'd encourage you to go and look at firstmedcomsjob.com, where there's lots of information about, um, about opportunities in the business. Um, and uh, these webinars are great. We can get people from all over the world. Um, and today we've got Matt Burns coming in from the States. Thank you very much, Matt. And Matt Evans from around the corner here in Oxford. Um, thank you very much. Um, and we've got a good international audience again today. Um, these webinars are recorded and they're posted on Network Pharma TV, where you'll find lots of videos now, recordings of webinars and other video content, but there's uh, 400 plus videos now. So lots of good resources to go and have a look at afterwards if you've not uh, been to uh, have a look so far. Um, but today, um, as I say, great to have the guys from the Miculum. Um, we're gonna have a, a presentation and, and some Q&A. So those of you online today, please use the text boxes. You've got a chat box, a QA and a box. Use those to, um, to send in your comments, questions and observations, and we'll weave those into the Q&A. Um, and um, on that note, I'm gonna hand over to the guys from Miculum to talk, about, talk to us about telling stories with data. Over to you, Matt Evans. Thank you very much, Peter. Let me just bring up the slides. So that we're all okay with that. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, Peter. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, happy lunchtime or whatever time it is where you are in the world. Um, we thought we'd introduce ourselves, but as you've got two white guys, both called Matt, uh, we thought we'd try and differentiate ourselves with a little visualization, uh, kick things off. So we tracked uh, our weekend just gone. Um, and what it threw up, uh, a couple of differentiators. I have two small children. So my sleep box is somewhat lesser than Matt's. Uh, my food and drink box is a little bit bigger there, making a meal for the family. In advance of this preparation, I got myself a haircut, which is what the self-care is there. So, you know, I was worried. I didn't bother having a shave though, so I've kind of let myself down there. Uh, but I've also got a dad taxi box at the bottom there for running my daughters to and from their dance classes. Uh, if, in terms of a formal introduction, I'm also the agency lead for 7.4. Uh, Matt, do you want to chip into your... Yeah, I can chip in, certainly, yeah. So certainly, uh, hi everyone, my name's Matt, Matt Burns. Um, so as, as Matt said, I don't have children, so I'm winning on the sleep front, and I don't have a dad taxi box at all. However, it didn't mean I didn't have to spend a bit, fair bit of the weekend tackling some chores. Um, and as Peter alluded to, I'm actually based in the States, I'm based in Hoboken in New Jersey, which means that far too much of my spare time is spent trying to tackle two countries' worth of tax requirements, hence there's a horrible red box sitting at the bottom there. So some work for improvement. For me, maybe exercise and self-care could be part of next weekend. Um, but as a more professional introduction, uh, so I'm Matt Burns. I'm a senior medical writer and a technical lead at Mother Skipper, one of the American agencies. Uh, prior to my, my world of medcoms, I was a veterinary surgeon. I moved to Mother Skipper six years ago in 2016, and I've been here ever since. I can't remember a life before MedComs. I've been doing this too long. Uh, as some people I saw in the participants list will know, because there's a few ex-colleagues and current colleagues in there. Um, so as Matt said, um, just to give people a frame of reference and how the link to Amiculum happens, um, Sample Four and Woodskipper are part of Amiculum in terms of a family of agencies. Uh, and we are going to have a chat with you about two threads that tie together nicely and are quite dear to words, which is storytelling and then data visualization and how we tell stories with data. So we thought we'd kick off with a traditional description of a story um, being a narrative, prose or verse, to interest, amuse or instruct. Um, I think it's not uh, too out of place to say, I'm sure everyone is familiar with how powerful a tool storytelling is. Uh, we know that it helps you connect with your audience. We've been telling stories pretty much since we've had language. Um, but sometimes you know, a picture tells a thousand words and an image can get that message across uh, a lot quicker than, than prose. So can a chart with a very simple one here uh, from NASA about the reduction in the mass ice mass in Greenland over the recent years. So taking those things in mind, perhaps we can go back to that description and get rid of the prose and verse and simply say a story is a narrative to instruct uh, amuse or interest. 
And storytelling is especially powerful when we do couple it with images. We've been doing that for several thousands of years. Um, it can help attract the audience attention. There's certainly evidence to suggest that it helps the audience process the message quickly and perhaps retain more of that information than pre simply presenting things in text alone. So when we come to telling stories with data, there are four elements that you need to have, what we feel, and so do others, to make an effective visualization. So we want the data, the information we want to share, uh, we want a story, we want our purpose, what we want the audience to do with that data, um, yeah, the design element. And you can have visualizations that have more or less of these, they're just more or less successful. So if you have data, uh, you know what you want to do with it, and you tell it in the story, but you've not really got much of a design, it can be just not really interesting to look at, quite ugly. Um, if you lose the um, the purpose of the information, you've got data, you've got a story, you're showing it well, but you're not quite sure what the person is supposed to do with it or take away, then your visualization has been fairly useless. Um, but having all of those four things together is what gets your clear, compelling and powerful visualization uh, and your story across. And they're very much overlapping. They don't really always, you shouldn't consider them as a sequence, but often there is a sequence and the data set is usually your kicking off point, particularly when you're thinking pure data visualization, having a robust data set and just delving into it and finding the story, finding the interesting data points. So oh, that's, no, oh, that's curious. I'd like to pull that out. I'd like to tell that to audience X for purpose Y. How are we going to wrap that up in a narrative? Now we're going to show that. It's sort of a traditional sequence, but we have clients and they don't always respect or understand the four components or, or, or the best sequence. So you don't get to interrogate a data set too often in medcoms, we find, not to the extent that we would if we were doing something for our own interest, where we might have looked at, uh, we've done plots of uh, birth rates and death rates in, in, in the post-war years, and we've looked at um, uh, the taxonomic structures of plants and how they uh, relate back and how that relates to medicine. So when you're doing something for fun, you can find the data set, find the story. Quite often clients come to you and they know the story, they know the data they want you to communicate. Here you go. Here's the story. Here's the plot points. And that's fine. Um, we don't often get that interrogating step, but we can certainly help as we would with any client, you know, interrogate, challenge the brief, make sure that they're using the right data. Can we strengthen the story? Um, are they clear on what the purpose is? Um, I guess one thing also, I don't know if others find this it'd be interesting to hear in the chat is that sometimes clients have got their story and they've worked workshopped it so much internally that they've sort of forgotten the audience and the lay audience and their perspective and saying well that really works and resonates for you guys um i'm not sure you've necessarily got all the points there for for putting into this visualization um and the other challenge that sometimes comes up is you do all that you do the data you do this purpose and you do the story and then the clients are a bit cautious and unwilling to go to anything beyond a conventional data visualization. Um, and that's not to say conventional is bad, as we'll see when we come to, to the later sections. Those traditional visualizations, whether it's a line graph or a bar chart, have been around a long time because they work. So you don't always need to do something fancy, but sometimes it can be a bit of a challenge when you've got what you think is a really interactive and interesting idea, but the client doesn't necessarily go for it. But, you know, I think that's medcoms, isn't it? Um, the other challenge is when they present us with something and they say, we want, we do want this really busy, busy, interactive, visual, intergraphic. And that's actually not the problem with it. The, the visualization itself may be simple and it works fine. It's the other elements that's the problem. It's not part of a cohesive story. It's not the data they should be showing. Um, so those are some of the, the, the challenges that come from uh, trying to proceed through the usual process and that come from having clients. But as I say, it's not always the case that um, fancy is best and sometimes a simple visualization can do the job for you as well uh, which is i'll hand over to matt to um, talk us through some things about the choice of data visualization thanks matt yes yeah, so once you've got that once you've got your data you've got your person you've got your story it comes down to thinking about your chart of choice um so you hop onto the next slide matt <clears throat> and it's worth reminding ourselves that whilst in medcoms it seems that we're forever working just with line graphs and bar charts and maybe the occasional pie chart. There is a, a plethora of different chart options that we have at our disposal. But before we fire up Excel and start creating some wonderfully colourful spider plots and, and butterfly prints and all sorts, it's worth considering 
the first bit. What communication are we trying to make? What story, what message are we trying to get across? Next slide, Matt. Because actually, within a, a single chart, within a single graphic, there's a limit to the number of types of stories that we can tell. Uh, and some of these, for everyone in MedComs, will be immediately familiar. Narrating that change over time is something that we're doing all the time. Every time you think about that randomized controlled trial result, uh, you know, that primary data of drug A versus placebo is typically shown in that line graph over time. And that's because it's an excellent choice of graph to convey that information. We're often highlighting contrast as well, from using the length of lines or the size of bars or other shapes to show that one thing is bigger than another. Uh, we do a lot of dissecting factor work. We're obviously working with population data, and often we want to be splitting that population into subgroups, and so that can be our story. And finally, we're also often profiling the outliers, which can be done spatially, as you can see on the screen here, but we can also do that quite simply just with a, a line graph or a bar chart. They're very good at showing a peak or showing a, uh, a trough to try and profile something that's different from the others. But there's a limit to the number of sort of data stories we can tell within, within one graphic. Next slide, Matt. So if we take the example we gave you at the very start with our introduction, where we had the purpose of trying to communicate to you guys how we spent our time over the weekend. And that was a story where we're, we're breaking down proportions of a, a total, our total weekend. So we're dissecting the factors. And actually a tree map was quite a nice way for us to do that. Big blocks of color, but very easy for you to compare. You can see within one tree map how much we spent you know, time doing our different activities. It also enabled you to compare the two tree maps very easily as well. Thinking about that example of that randomized controlled trial data, as I said, it's, it's no accident that we end up on a line graph when we think about presenting that primary result. It's an excellent way of communicating trends over time. But sometimes our audience and our purpose can change using the same data set. So if you think about that randomized controlled trial data, sometimes we may have less time with an audience. We may be working on an MSL deck or a commercial deck, and we know that our speaker's only got three or four minutes with a doctor, in which case we may not want to spend the time developing this uh, line graph for them and showing them the full trial results. We may just want to focus on the endpoints. We may just want to compare drug A, placebo, what was the result, in which case we're telling a slightly different story there. We're making a comparison, and therefore we choose a different graph. So the chart design in this flow tends to come last for a good reason. Once you've worked at everything else, you can then think about what you want to be communicating. Next slide, Matt. And this is going to be a theme of today's talk, but often simplicity is best. It's lovely if in a clean and clear way we can tell a single story in one graphic. And the one on the left, which Matt showed earlier, is a fantastic example of that. You look at the title, Greenland Mass Variation Since 2002, and you look at the shape of that line graph and you know the story instantly. You know that it's not good news. You don't actually need the other bits of information there. You don't even need the rate of change, which is jumping out of us. In one graphic, it's communicated that story brilliantly. But sometimes we have the opportunity to allow our audience to invest a little bit more time and we can think about a more complex approach. So this is similar data on the right, showing that change in mass of ice over time using the actual graphics of the physical change in mass. So if we have a little bit more time with our audience and they're allowed to invest in that message, it can help because particularly with this example, it almost creates emotional connection. They're spending their time discovering just how quickly that is shrinking. So sometimes we can use explanatory data on the left to very quickly show a story. And sometimes we can allow a little bit more time for our audience to invest and explore the story themselves, exploratory type data. But We'll now go through a few case studies of showing you how simplicity can often work very well. So simplification and sensible choices. We'll do a few examples here. Uh, and this example is trying to communicate for a company, their employees attendance on client Zoom calls. Are they late, are they on time, are they early? Now, even though clients sometimes send us some very awful slide templates, I'm pretty sure we can all agree, none of us are gonna be sending this to a client it's, it's pretty disgusting. But if we think about why it doesn't work, it can maybe help us think about what we can do better to communicate a clearer story. So first of all, the colors, that bright orange jumping out at you is too bold, it's really quite offensive. There's also the fact that it's signaling the on-time proportion of meeting attendance, when orange itself has connotations of sort of warning, that amber color uh, sort of almost strikes danger. So it's, it's not an appropriate choice. Whereas the latecomers, they're tucked in as black at the bottom. 
You've also got these horrible trend lines cutting across the graph, which are really quite distracting. And the fact that the width of our bars is narrower than the width of the gaps between them means that those trend lines end up dominating the page and causing too much of a distraction. We've got a legend in the bottom left, the bottom right hand corner, sorry. And that's a good thing, but our little squares there are so small, it's quite difficult to even relate them to the graph. We've also got the fact that our legend is running horizontally and our graph is running vertically, which makes the sort of intuitive understanding of it quite difficult. But most importantly, when you look at this graph, there's absolutely no clear story that it's communicating. You can't work out our intention of showing it to you. But we can hopefully do something a little bit different. we will show you that on the next slide. Thanks, Matt. So instantly here, you can see it's the same data set, but it's very clear what our communication message is. It's very clear what our story is. And all we've done is, is reordered the, the stacks and the bar. So we've got the lateness coming at the end. We've toned down the colors of on time and early because they were distracting. We don't really want people to focus on them. We just want them to focus on who was late. We've kept the same information, but we've now ordered it in order of lateness. So it's very easy for people to pick up and find out which employees are turning up late, and which employees are not turning up late. They can explore that themselves. And finally, by highlighting the average, we provide a bit more context. And with a sensible chart title, we make our story very, very clear. It's very obvious now what we're trying to communicate with this graphic. I'd say this was, was borrowed from example from storytellingwithdata.com, which is an excellent blog. It's full of decent resources to look into data visualization. So feel free to, to explore that later on. Next slide, please, Matt. So this is another example I've picked out, uh, one that's a little bit old now from a major broadcasting corporation that shows that even some of the big boys can get it wrong sometimes. Uh, and this is an example of a, a poor choice of chart. So they've chosen a pie chart here to try and communicate uh, Sam Allardyce's performance at four different clubs. So his first five games, the number of points he scored. Uh, the challenge is, is that the pie chart is good for some things. It's good at showing the breakdown of the total but it's not very good for making comparisons. Normally you use a pie chart for breaking down a population, for example. Matt and I could have used it at the start when we showed what we did over the weekend. But here, we're trying to make a comparison. Our total is actually meaningless, so it's a poor choice of chart. But the other challenge with pie charts is it's very difficult for an audience to, to translate segments into meaningful comparisons. If I were to ask you which is bigger, the gray or the blue, you could probably work out that the blue is slightly bigger, but it takes you a little while to do it. It's not instant. And if I asked you how many times bigger is the yellow than the blue, I think everyone in this call would give us a slightly different range of answers. Is it six, seven, eight, nine times bigger? It's not instinctively easy to tell that. And the human brain is not geared up for making that comparison. And like with bars, where it is. Next slide, Matt. So here's something that we could have done differently if we were making that graph again. It's the exact same data, but it's communicated in a different way. And immediately when you see this, you can sort of see the main point that the graphic is trying to get across. We've introduced some chronology, which the previous graph lacks. So we're actually showing the story over time, which is helpful for our to sort of get some context. But that outlier at the bottom, that crystal palace outlier is jumping out at you now, the fact that it sits at the end of the graph as well. So it's a much clearer comparison. And obviously with some sensible text around it, the story of this graphic is now much more apparent. Next slide, Matt. So finally, we'll give a MedCommons example, which I'm sure you're, you're all crying out for. Um, so this is a client who came to us wanting to show that non-small cell lung cancer comprised of multiple different types of mutations. And they had a secondary objective as well, which is they wanted to highlight four key mutations that were relevant to them. So here you can see two pie charts. And a pie chart could be an appropriate choice for this because we're showing the breakdown of the total. The problem is, is that we've got way too many data sets involved. And as a result, we've got way too many colors and that's causing us problems. Firstly, we've almost got a duplication of color going on. We've got those two reds that are jumping out at you and they're a bit too similar. We've got so many data sets that in our legend, our tiny, tiny boxes of color are so difficult to see that you can't really relate them to the actual graph. The fact that you're now just looking at that right-hand list shows us that perhaps a table or even listing these would have been better than the pie chart. And we've also committed a bit of a sin because we've used the same color on our left graph and on our right one. So your brain instinctively thinks that those two purples or those two greens are linked, and in fact, they're not. So 
whilst this is doing something to communicate the story that this is complicated and there are multiple mutations, there's a lot that can be improved. Next slide, Matt. And here's another way of doing it, which we think is slightly better. So this is a pie chart that's sitting underneath a donut chart. And obviously a donut chart is effectively just a pie chart with a hole taken out the middle of it. But because we've rotated that pie chart, because of how we've structured the donut chart, it's instinctively obvious that we're showing the breakdown of that adenocarcinoma population in the donut chart. We don't need that horrible line going across to say one is moving to the other. And rather than using color, we've used shades of the purple here to show that breakdown within that adenocarcinoma population. We've still got that bold effect to bring out the uh, specific mutations our client were interested in. So this is much better, it's much clearer, it's much easier to understand. It's not as uh, unhappy on the eye, but it's not perfect either because you can see a little bit of bunching going on, especially in that bottom right bit. There's, there's so many data sets that it's causing a little bit of confusion. So maybe there's one more way we could try this. Matt. Thank you. So here we just have a stacked bar chart, back to our bar chart once again. I'm a big fan, you can probably tell. Um, but here we've done something slightly different as well. We've actually arranged within that second bar our mutations to give them a little bit more structure. We've domain, arranged the mutations by the type of protein that they're coding for. So it provides a bit more logical sense to the graph overall. We're still using tone to put out differences within that population, and we're still bolding those specific ones of interest for our clients, but it's not so it's not so obvious. It's not telling sort of dominating the page a little bit. It's just there for interest. So there's just a few examples of, of how with some simplification, some sensible chart choices and, and other choices, we can communicate a much clearer message, tell a much clearer story. And I hand back over to Matt for some other tips and tricks. Thank you very much. So uh, data visualization is a big field and could be a series of uh, seminars in its own right. And uh, I won't pretend to try and uh, replicate that here in the time we have. But what we thought we could do is just run through some very basic guiding principles, some of which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, some of which you may not be, or some of which you may be doing, but you don't quite know why. Uh, and then uh, give you some uh, suggested places to go and, and find some more information. So if you think about what we're trying to do when we're trying to tell a story with our data. We're wanting to highlight what's important and avoid distractions. So it helps think about what makes people notice things. And uh, this helps us into the realm of uh, pre-attentive processing, which I'm sure physiologists and neurologists on the call will know far more about than I do. But what we do when we run our data visualization training uh, for our new starters is we do an exercise. And that we split the group into two and we ask one half, we time them and say, okay, how long does it take you to count all the fives in that box? And we tell people to put their hand up when they're finished. Um, we get a rough average. And then we say to the other half, okay, how long does it take you to count all the sixes in that box? And once they've got over the suspicious nature and uh, I've not tried to trick them, I've only colored some of them. Once they've made the association between six is a blue, they just need to see the blue amongst the black. They're not having to go through like the first group did and find the shape of the five in amongst seven, eight, nine, or the different shapes. So they're able to use this pre-attentive processing, which happens very quickly and it's kind of uh, below the level of consciousness. And it's because humans are uh, very adept at spotting variation in certain attributes within a group. So within a group there, you, you can spot the one that's the different color, that's the different intensity, orientation, uh, size, and so forth. Um, spatial position, uh, which is why, you know, we all spend so much time obsessing with the fact that a reference is jumping slightly between one slide and the next, because it's just taking the viewer's eye away because something spatially has changed when we're not trying to do that. Um, so we can take advantage of this and use variation in these attributes when we're trying to highlight what's important, but just as importantly, avoid the variation in those attributes from distracting the audience. And it works with text as well. It's why we make things bold and underlined and italic. Um, so if you understand that, you can use that within any of your visualizations to try and make sure that they're doing their job effectively. The trick we have in medcoms or the problem we have to overcome in medcoms is that we often also use variation in those attributes to put data into different data sets. 
So we're quite often dealing with more than one thing that we're trying to plot and show. So, you know, drug A versus placebo, we want to make them distinct from each other. So we use a different color just to just differentiate the data sets. For you can imagine on a PK, PD curve, you've got different concentrations being studied. You might use a different shape uh, marker for your different, uh, uh, for your different lines, which is fine. But there is a limit to the number of variations that humans can process at that sort of pre-attentive level. And it varies depending on what the attribute is, but once you sort of get beyond four or five different colors, three or four different shapes, you're making the viewer work a lot harder to instinctively, pre-attentively spot those differences. It can be done and it has to be done based on the data sets that we have to communicate in MedComs, but it's just worth our remembering uh, and thinking, do you need that color variation when you perhaps might not Matt had that example earlier with the pie chart in it? They didn't need to be different colors, even though there were different data sets, different data points in terms of mutations, because there were just key ones we wanted to pick out. Um, the other challenge, particularly when you come uh, to color, is uh, cultural uh, uh, its significance and how that might vary country to country. We're a multinational industry communicating to different audiences. Um, personal preference as well. I mean, that's design as a whole, isn't it? And I'm sure we've all got uh sob stories where we've got something we loved and the designer loves and the client just particularly wanted it a certain way or a certain color or a certain font might alluded to some of the god awful you know branding templates you get sent and the powerpoint templates and you just think oh if we really got to work within this it's kind of working against the principles we were talking about before um but just be careful when you uh doing color choices um and all of these things personal preference will come into play but if you've got some argument as to why you've done what you've done it just helps you push back a little bit to say well i appreciate that you really love that yellow but from a sort of visualization and data, visual processing point of view we're suggesting it may not be the right call another uh, principle uh, is one to think of the visualization as having data ink and non-data ink so you think your data ink is your data points and your non-data ink is everything else on that graphic that is there to help you tell the story but isn't the data itself titles axes grid lines references whatever it might be and so the theory is that you should maximize the data ink send it all the way up to 11 uh, and minimize the non-data ink and make sure that what you've got there needs to be there and if it is there it's not drawing the eye so that's quite often why you will drop things down to grays uh, smaller font sizes still compliant of course in terms of legibility and so forth but um that's an interesting point actually sometimes we feel that those compliance guidelines about legibility do sort of fly slightly in the face of what you're trying to do to get the data across um but the data ink is the key so if you can enhance what we've uh, what we're trying to show using the variations in visual attributes that we talked about and de-emphasize the non-data ink, your message and your story will stand a greater chance of getting through. And as I alluded to right at the beginning, I'm sure this is what everyone is doing anyway. You're probably already doing this. So when you put your data into Excel and PowerPoint and it spits out a chart, I'm sure most of us are already stripping out the, the, the grid lines, stripping out the borders, knocking back the, the bold colors. So uh, intuitively, I think a lot of us are doing it, but those are the sort of principles as to why we're doing it. Um, and I think if you can do those, you're going to be uh, sound a great chance of getting your story across effectively. And so Matt mentioned um, storytelling with uh, data uh, blog. It was a great site um, in terms of other people to have a look at. Um, uh, there were a couple of references I showed there. Stephen Few has shown me the numbers book. Uh, Cole Naflick, her storytelling with data book. Nancy Duarte, uh, Resonate and Slideology are, are great for narrative and, and effective slide presentation if you're talking about presentations specifically um, i'm sure a lot of you may have heard of david mccandless and his information is beautiful uh, books uh, they're great for inspiration the the guardian uh, newspaper has a good data blog on its site so does the new york times and there's various uh, communities and, and websites and i'm more than happy to to help guide people to others if uh, they, they send me a note uh, afterwards or in the chat order. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting field to explore and it's quite collaborative in that there's lots of times where somebody will post a visualization saying, anybody got any suggestions and sort of the community and the blog users dive in and say, I'd maybe do it this way, I'd maybe do it that way, uh, which is great when you're dealing with what is a subjective um, medium. But I'll hand back to Matt to uh, wrap us up with some final thoughts and then we can get to the Q&A. Thanks, Matt. If you could push us on one more slide. 
Uh, it wouldn't be a PowerPoint presentation if we didn't end on some sort of cartoon or comic. So here you are. And I hope today that Matt and I have done our best to convince you that with some simplification and some sensible choices and some tips and tricks to remove some of the clutter, we can communicate our data stories uh, to the client a little bit more clearly. But we've also shown this cartoon for another reason, this comic for another reason. Next slide, Matt. And that's it, because actually recently with a client at Mudskipper, we've been very fortunate to be able to work on uh, a graphic novel. Uh, and this is designed for patients, it's a patient audience. And it is intended to help communicate the um, symptoms, the diagnosis and the treatment options for a rare blood disorder. Uh, and so it's just a nice reminder, I appreciate fully that it's not gonna be very often we're gonna be working on graphic novels of our clients. But it's a reminder for us that there are other ways that we can be communicating, other ways that we can be telling stories of our audience beyond the traditional ones that we normally think of. Uh, and final slide, please, Matt. Which brings us back to the old adage of the challenges of working with clients. Uh, and we've intentionally saved this one to a last because it's probably the one that people are most familiar with, whether you've been in Medcons for, for 10 weeks or 10 years. Having a client ask to include some additional data, wanting more and more and more information in whatever project they're doing, is something that we can all probably recognize. Uh, and that causes some problems sometimes because the more information you have there, the more you dilute your story to the point where sometimes your story and the purpose behind a very clear message can be completely washed away. So what can we do? Final slide, Matt. Well, two things. First, to help clients recognize that less can be more when it comes to data, particularly if you're trying to tell one very clear story. Can we suggest to them that those additional secondary endpoints and all those nominal p-values they want to throw in could be moved to the appendix at the back of the slide deck or could be put in the supplementary, uh, supplementary materials rather than distracting everyone by sitting in the bulk of the project but also that there are alternative ways to deliver information alternative ways to deliver that message beyond just intensive manuscripts and powerpoint presentations um, we are lucky enough to work on a few Projects designed for patients, uh, working with patient advocacy groups, some videos, some plain language summaries, and some infographics. And typically these do contain less data. The client seems to be aware that in order to communicate a clearer story uh, with that audience, you need to strip back the data a little bit as well. So the question remains is, is can we expand that to perhaps more of our projects, more of our ATP projects? Because data is fantastic, but it shouldn't be king. And it shouldn't be the case where more and more data is then actually affecting the message that we're trying to communicate. And that's a, a daily battle, perhaps, with clients. And we can maybe go through some examples in the Q&A, um, but something to bear in mind, certainly. Um, so thank you very much, Peter, for having us. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And uh, excited to hear some questions. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Um, and if we just lose those slides. Um, once again, I, I, I listened to a presentation like that, and I must admit, I'm, I'm just dead impressed. It was lovely. Um, and I just think, you know, some of that, and I think, Matt Evans, you were talking about it, is that sort of line between what you do intuitively, as you get more experience, you do it anyway, versus actually thinking about stuff, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and at what point do you start thinking more actively? And then you get presentations like that, which just really prove the point that thinking is actually quite good um, and you can improve so many things in, in sometimes in quite simple ways but also I'm, I, I guess it's a fair point to say that you can hear a presentation like that you can go oh that's obvious and that's simple but actually in real life it can be quite complex can't it I mean it's, you know you do have to put some real thought into this to get that data visualization to work properly do you think people underestimate the complexity of making something simple if you understand what I'm saying. Matt, yeah, I certainly, go. yeah. I'm sure there's various um, industries and so forth where that doing something well and doing something cleanly and simply is, is half the battle and is tricky. I think the reason why we, we try and sort of do that training I mentioned to, to everyone is, as you say, Peter, to try and have it ha bubbling along under the surface with everything everybody's doing. And so it helps then that you're not just thinking of it at the design stage when it goes to the studio or wherever it is at the end. Everyone's trying to live by those principles in everything they do, whether it's a, a final piece or just a summary report they're trying to do for the client. Um, you sort of provide them the, the guidance to apply those techniques. Um, but certainly 
uh, yeah, you, it's worth spending the time. And then, of course, he brings us the uh, old adage of, well, do clients actually pay for that? Um, well, yes, I think you can try and work it into budgets. But as I say, if, you've, if you're trying to get it happening under the surface, across the board, or across the life cycle of the project, you've not suddenly got to hit them with, you know, 14 studio hours at the end of the, at the end of the process to to justify being um, for your data visualization steps. But certainly, we try and uh, and build it in throughout. Um, there's an element to clients have also sometimes. Well, it's, I guess this relates more to the complexity and the more interesting visualization is sometimes it can be seen as less scientifically credible. If you move away from the line graph and the bar chart and you've spent a bit of time doing that, and, and there's a good reason, but people are like, well, I don't know, is this whizzy? Is this marketing that you're trying to do with us here? And particularly from the medical side, you do have to sort of take them on a journey of this is still robust scientific data. It's evidence-based. It has to be. That's what we do. But just because it's visually interesting doesn't sort of make it less scientifically credible. Just um, members, we have got a, a large audience here. Please do uh, use the two chat boxes to send in some questions and, and comments, and we'll try and weave that into the um, into the conversation. Um, I thought just uh, you've talked a bit about the training. I, again, I find that sort of aspect you know, interesting. Um, I think Catherine's picked up on this point um, or asked a question. Um, uh, data visualization often led by graphic designers, um, but the designers lack the understanding of the context of data while the writer may not be the visual thinker. I'm just wondering, um, and she specifically said, how can we empower non-graphic designers to think about visualization of data? I think there's an interesting point in there, and I'm, I'm sort of interested in the context of your training. When you're faced with new people coming into the business, uh, you know, how do, have you got some simple, um, you can't do the whole thing here, but you've got some simple ideas that you can share. Um, and, and again, I'm sort of interested, do you find people, I guess you would, are some people must be naturally able to embrace yeah. these ideas and some people can't I just just talk a little bit around that um oh, matt evans in the first place but i'm also interested matt matt b in what you're thinking of there yeah i mean definitely as i say we we take everyone through writers editors whoever is joining us in whatever role through these principles so they understand these basics not only so that they can be doing it but we always try and say to them, look, if you're one of those people that says, oh, I'm not, I'm, no, I'm not visual, that's not me, that's not my cup of tea, in terms of aptitude, we say, that's fine. Again, that's what you've got people in sort of design and, and studio roles for, but you have to understand why we're doing it. You have to get the principle behind what we're trying to achieve, even if it's not you that's uh, able to do it. And we've had people that are more or less yeah, uh, skillful at it just off the bat in terms of related to the their background and whether they were, you know, kind of arty people as outside of work and that kind of thing. Um, so certainly there's people with more design flair. We've got people in data visualization roles that started as writers and editors, and it was their design interest, hobby, if you like, that helped them move in that direction. We've also ran some sessions with the design team. The, the agency leads for our design group have asked us to sort of talk from the from the scientist side if you like because quite a lot of them are not scientists by training they're designers and 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 had that um help them get an understanding of why we're trying to do with some of the different the chart and the non-chart data and, and the complexities of the chart choice perhaps um but it helps the two sides to come and meet together in the middle i don't know matt if you want to add a bit more no oh, yeah you know also well, myself coming in as a, as a writer from a sort of almost a non-science well not non-scientific you know, starting out as a vet, but I didn't, I didn't go through that sort of PhD route. So I wasn't handling data in the same way day to day, um, but still the role involved an awful lot of communication uh, and the sort of the clarity of communication is sort of the one thing I was able to sort of bring across. And I think that one thing we do quite well is just sort of best practice sharing and the, the benefits of that. I mean, this is an example today, we're able to share with a really wide audience, but even internally, you know, we, we have use our internal Yammer, we have data visualization groups within our Yammer, uh, you know, to not just sort of share projects that we've seen externally, but, but client facing ones as well, where we can. So getting that sort of daily reminder almost or that weekly reminder of or here's how we can sort of do things a little bit differently um yeah it's just a sort of nice constant top up of any sort of formal training that people might receive when they first join can i just pick up a point i think i think matt you you said something like this i'm not quite sure what the answer to this is have you got roles within the miculum that are specifically data visualization uh, data visualizers whatever the expression is i don't know you know as opposed to writers or designers you, you you seem to indicate that but did i get the wrong message there yeah no that's true i mean one of the handy things is you know we don't have fixed job titles so we're able to 
people just have a role without us to worry about what that is. But we, yeah, we've had the people that uh, started out in the writing and editing role and have transitioned into that, and they're now doing data visualization, if you like, you know, full time as opposed to their traditional writer and editor roles. So we've, uh, yeah, we've got those people at 7.4, and we were created that role, which happened over time. It was something we wanted to get into as a as an agency, uh, and so these people showed an interest. So it was one of those things where you say, okay, let's yeah, let's do some training session. Let's get some external training. You go and build up your skills and then their roles morphs over time and then before you know it yeah they're full-time doing that role so it's, yeah it's been quite nice okay and it's, okay. it's great of course the business were quite aware of that as well because uh, you know I, I did some data viz training at, uh, i was lucky to go to to a master class that sort of must give put me on and then we hosted an internal um thing to sort of share what we'd learned and then a few occasions after that other members of the team were sending me some information saying actually we've got this this challenge we want to try and communicate this information a different way and similarly i know that if i have a project and i'm struggling to sort of get my head around some data viz work i can contact matt and his team and say actually could someone just look at this for me and, and provide a different perspective because i've been plugged into the data matrix for too long so sort of been able to have to lean on people who you know just have that little bit more experience in the companies it's fantastic okay um can we just pick up a couple of practical questions and i didn't want to lose this one uh, rachel asked uh, rachel asked very early on um, about um uh, factoring in color blindness um making the point that board games use icons and so on and I'm, I'm pretty sure i didn't miss it you didn't sort of address that in the presentation so can we talk to that point a little bit yeah it's one of the things we we say we run through in the the training when we talk about the color we delve a little bit more into color blindness and the sort of proportions of that and the kind of colors makes people aware of the colors that are quite often affected uh, a little bit more into uh the cultural significance of certain colors which you have to be careful about because you don't want to paint a broad brush that certain people you know respond more or less well to certain kind of colors but certainly in terms of what they're associated with in different cultures yeah it's certainly something you have to bear in mind and it's probably something as i think sadly people experiencing color blindness will find this throughout life where you, you find people haven't paid as much attention to it uh, as they might otherwise i'm going to show my ignorance here i mean the, 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 there are instances where it, it's just i mean how do you solve that problem in some instances um i it's not i mean you would hope for one to solve is it no i mean you would hope that again if more i guess this is a we're talking about uh awareness campaign aren't we <laughs> just across the board of for that because the people that are setting up branding guidelines and branding templates and powerpoint templates are bearing that in mind from that point as well as those of us that are then populating those things um you would hope that most people are aware of the sort of you know the red green issues and um try and get beyond that but you've only got to look at a traffic light to think that well it's not always born in mind is it and it's exactly. flagged in the presentation as well there's there's things that we can do beyond the color if we're using tone rather than flashing colors if we're using exactly yeah. using something else to to make the difference there, there are ways around it but i think that's right it probably gets overlooked more than it should Okay, and, and 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 again, we didn't really touch on it, but I guess part of this is um, we, which we could have gone talking about was sort of animation and um, you know the the sort of opportunity to make data come to life, mm. you know, in in very different ways now than just drawing a picture sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, animation and video—that's where content is going, isn't it? In terms of a lot of what we do, a lot of our projects, we're we're trying to get away from that static to something animated. Uh, it sometimes causes a little bit of anxiety on the client's part. I always find because you sort of they're they're trusting that the viewer is going to go to the end of the animation, go to the end of the video. Uh, it's true if you have a series of static images as well, I suppose. It also that, right. that plays into the the thing Matt was saying about the exploratory exploratory. Um, visualizations are the ones where people delve and click and filter and things um, they're really great and I think they're really interesting and engaging but clients can often be a bit wary of I, I'd really like them to go this path you know very fixed and as long as you have to work hard to say well they're going to get to the same end point and they're going to have visited the same landmarks on the way but they're not necessarily all taken the same route so yeah certainly there's a bit to overcome but, uh, but I think as you say video and animation Certainly, I'm sure most people find it more engaging than static images. I sometimes okay. feel that animation is one of the examples that Matt gave where a client will come and say, we want an animation, we want to animate this without really thinking through exactly why they want to do it. Uh, you know, they haven't really thought about the data and the purpose and they realise that their initial graph is, is just perfect for communicating the message, but because it's a buzz thing at the moment, they'll go and push for it. 
uh, and that can be a bit of a challenge to say, okay, you could be putting quite a big budget behind animation, um, which is maybe engaging, but do your clients, your, your customers have four or five minutes to sit here and watch this when you could perhaps with a single single slide deliver the exact same message. So yeah, I'm sort of a little bit on the fence sometimes where animation is, is truly a better way of communicating than, than a single image can be. Okay, okay. And we're going to run out of time in a minute. So I need to, uh, we need to be thinking about that. But um, we did sort of start in terms of talking about stories, I mean, storytelling, and then and the use of data, but it's very much, I mean, uh, we, uh, you know, I guess, in, in truth, we've focused, focused more on the data visualization side of things than the storytelling. Um, just to come back to that a little bit, and, and I don't know whether this is going to make sense as a, as a question, but as someone who's been around in Medcoms for a very long time, I admit it, storytelling has been talked about a lot in the last few years. And, and I know you're one of the agencies that's talked a lot about it. Um, I, I suppose what I'm, you know, did we just not get it right in the old days or were we storytelling <laughs> without realizing it? Has storytelling become a bit of a sort of a, a language and a sort of a narrative and a whatever in itself to, to make sense of what we're doing? You see what I'm saying? No, I mean, I'm, I'm just I sort of wondering, it's how that works in real life how you know is storytelling something real or is it just what we were doing anyway without putting words on it do you, do you know what i'm trying to say i, I sort of agree it looks you like know. matt you're going to answer me anyway yeah <laughs> I think, no i think it was it, it's certainly a bit of a buzzword and a bit of a marketing mm. word at the moment um but we, when you break it down as to what it is it's, it's using a narrative to try and convey a message to somebody and so we are doing storytelling every day which is perhaps not recognizing it in the same way and so every time we're you know communicating information on a slide intrinsically we're trying to communicate a message and there's a reason why you'll have your title of the slide as the conclusion because that's the end of your story there's a reason why your focus and your brain goes to the end of that graph at the end because that's the conclusion of the story and everything else within that page sort of becomes your beginning in the middle of the story so we're doing it without really thinking about it so maybe yes we're putting more of a label on it but once you recognize that it's actually then quite useful to communicate information to, to clients and to give a, a practical example recently that I can I can share we were working with the client on a slide and they were trying to convey some information about uh, regulatory change in Italy for a drug and how that was prescri uh, affecting prescriptions and the publication had a wonderful map of Italy that uh, showed all the changes in, in different districts and when it happened over time it was a heat map but it was completely unnecessary for the story they wanted to tell. So we had to have a conversation with the client and say, you've included this data, this graphic, which is actually distracting from your message, it's distracting from your story. Your story really is quite simple. You had the change and it affected prescriptions. So let's just communicate that, that's the story. And once we put it in that language, in terms of talking about the message and the story to the client, they could concede that this superfluous information of this lovely picture of Italy, uh, wasn't necessary to communicate the message so yes maybe we are putting a label on it but actually recognizing that and owning it can be quite useful in our conversations with clients okay no, that, that makes absolute sense and, and i think that very neatly summed it up but matt i'm just going to finish with you matt matt evans have you got a comment to add to that just to, to wrap this up yeah as you say it's it's hopefully what we've been doing for years and that you looked at a first draft of somebody's outline or presentation and when it doesn't flow and therefore you were thinking of story you were thinking of the narrative and the sequence you just perhaps didn't have this 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 label to hang on to say this is what we're doing but you would hope that throughout we've been trying to think of the sequence the label is handy sometimes to get away from and i guess ted talks have helped with this uh, and encourage people to think of don't forget you're trying to tell the audience a story you're not trying to show them a sequence of data points so storytelling uh, and that thinking of narrative and using those words helps bring people back to the idea of you should start don't start by saying i want to show this 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 and this slide because these this these, these are the six endpoints i want to show you go well what's the story you want to tell what's your narrative and then what are you going to show to back that up and get this over get away from this sort of overload of slides that you sometimes 52 slides for you know for a 10 minute presentation and that kind of thing so it's yeah it's just it's just, hopefully it's, we've been doing it but it's a little language it's a little more vocabulary perhaps to help explain why we're doing what we're doing okay okay i thought that was lovely thank you very much and um, i hope we've given everyone lots of food for thought in there i know we've got some questions that haven't been covered off and um, if you're watching this today then don't rush away we're still here till the top of the hour and we'll carry on going with some of those questions um but I, I just as a general point and this this is a dealing uh, there's a, a number of questions around this i mean the basic principle that, that you stressed you know simplicity is good um you know it's not a question just stripping it down for a patient or something you know actually if you're in a room full of 
top opinion leaders, very clever people, whatever you want, you know, simple visualization, simple storytelling is actually just effective communication. Um, and, and, and we should all be thinking about that for all those audiences. So, okay, look, I'm going to stop there. Thank you hugely for what you did there. I think that was very, very good. Um, people in the audience, people watch the video later, I know I can speak for both Max um, and say that you're both very happy to be contacted via LinkedIn is an easy way. Um, so please do follow up. Part of the point of these webinars is to encourage people to make connections. So please do. Um, thank you much uh, for watching. Um, if you're interested in what I'm doing, medcomsnetworking.com is the simple place to go and have a quick look and see what I'm up to and what the uh, range of resources are. So please come and join in. Uh, but for today, I'd like to say a big thank you. Um, and stop the recording there. So if we just give everybody a wave and say bye-bye and take care of yourself in these very strange times. Bye-bye.